Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Naval and Military Club for a discussion of the important uh, issue of free speech. Uh, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the president of one of four uh, think tanks uh, which have organized this occasion. Um, we're the principal organizer, so to speak. We got on the phone first, um, but I'd like to thank the institutions and those who run them for being involved as well, because without their support and without the reputation they have acquired, uh, this would be we would not get such a distinguished audience. Um, obviously, um, they they are known in this city not well, the better than the Danube Institute, which is based, after all, in Budapest. But it's not the first occasion in which the Danube Institute has organised and run a, a successful conference here. We've done so about three times, but they have been on more specialised topics. This is one of much greater general interest, and so we are hoping for a larger and more varied audience. Uh, having said that, let me just say the topic of free speech could not be more important. Um, the, um, at the moment, we can see it occupies uh, the attention of three major countries. Um, I, and one major international institution. They are, of course, the United States, where the new president is proposing to make the preservation or rescue of free speech the cornerstone of his policies. He said this in much more explicit terms than politicians usually commit themselves to. Uh, secondly, in this city, of course, um, a different political um, ideology is in control, and it is making very different noises about um, the preservation of free speech. Uh, on the contrary, it is much, instead of supporting it and embracing it and defending it, it seems to be far more stressing the necessity for control of free speech, and that necessity for control has morphed from the, the from speeches into the actions of the police, and that is something which obviously concerns people. Um, I should mention that tomorrow, um, Anthony O'Hare and I will be going to Dublin where he will be delivering uh, almost the same speech um, to an audience of equally concerned uh, people um, in a country which will have just stopped voting in a general election. And I would say on the basis of following Irish politics reasonably well, and reading the latest reports that free speech is certainly not less threatened in Ireland today than it is here. And these are, uh, these are very worrying th uh, uh, things and very worrying times. Now, I mentioned, but I didn't mention, the names of the organizations that are working with the Danube Institute on this occasion. <coughs> Um, uh, one is the um, New Culture Forum. Um, uh, Peter Whittle, unfortunately, can't be here, but I see Rafe Haeckel Manku, who is his, um, um, well, able uh, is <laughs> deputy uh, president, and I look forward to anything he may have to say. Um, the the um, we do not have as. Our second uh, sponsor is The Critic uh, magazine, and that is represented here by Graham Stewart. I'm delighted he's able to be here, uh, and I hope that this will give The Critic, which of course is beginning to challenge the uh, distinguished uh, uh, organ of which Michael Gove, who's present, has recently become editor. That's the kind of battle I really like in journalism, and I look forward uh, to what ha what um, what they both say, uh, not about tonight necessarily, but about uh, the issues which we are dealing with. Um, and then I see Toby Young, who's the head of so many organizations devoted to the preservation of free speech and other good things, that if I were to list them, Toby, we wouldn't have time for the speech. So I want to say just very warmly how how much we appreciate what uh, you have done in these important battles because they cannot simply be left to political parties um, anymore. They have to be mount uh, fought by a concerned citizenry. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we should also, I should say a word about uh, Buckingham University simply because uh, our two speakers are associated closely with it uh, and um, it, we owe it to the 
we owe it to the fact that uh, the, the tolerance of university that they are speaking here tonight. And secondly, um, we owe it to the fact that the, uni that the university has itself uh, got an event in London this week. The fact that it's not a formal sponsor on this occasion, it doesn't it can scarcely be expected to compete with itself. Um, so having said all of that, let me just give you the title again. Um, the title is The Case Against the Case Against Free Speech, which signifies what I think is true, that the arguments against free speech have been heard in the last 10 or 15 years far more readily than arguments in its defense. And we think we know what the arguments in its defense are, but somehow when that happens, what you find is that um, people forget the good arguments that they used to believe in. Um, they find these new, um, exciting, interesting um, uh, cases being made on the other side somehow more interesting. And if we don't watch it after a while, we find ourselves um, forgetting what the balance of argument really is and why so much of our, so many of our liberties depends ultimately on free speech. We have on this occasion two distinguished um, luminaries to, um, to, to address the topic. The main lecture is being given by Professor Anthony O'Hare. I think you all know him, but to say that simply that he's a distinguished philosopher. For many years, the editor of the journal Philosophy, a journal of the Royal Institute of Philosophy, um, and he, after several academic uh, positions in, in, in philosophy, he is now at the at Buckingham University. Um, I welcome uh, welcome him and look look forward to what he has to say. And um, uh, and um, we have a colleague of his, uh, um, Eric Weissman, uh, as the um, man who will give the first response. But not only response, because obviously there are people in this audience who've got. Uh, powerful and interesting and passionate views, and we do not want to, in a speech, in an evening devoted to free speech, we don't want to cut it off uh, after the two speeches. So, uh, on the other hand, we do want to get to the drinks. So, so having said that, let me be, turn over the evening uh, to my colleague, David Elroy Bolt, uh, a, a fellow at the Danube Institute, and uh, invite him to be, to, um, to be the Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, John. Thank you, Toby, Graham, and Peter in his absence. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be the Danube Institute's Anglosphere Fellow, the first one to be based here in London, and as such to welcome you all to my first gig, uh, my first gig, which I hope you will enjoy. I hope you will all come again. A word, please, about the questions that I know you will all be formulating during the two speeches. Please make them as pertinent and as concise as possible and keep your observations to the drinks afterwards. We would like to get as many questions in as possible. We'd like to hear as many views as possible. That said, please, may I invite Professor Antonio here to begin. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, this lecture is an attack on the attack which is currently being waged in various quarters on free speech. In order to contextualize this topic um, and to show its contemporary relevance, I'm going to begin with a free sto story, a true story, um, actually about somebody who is here. Rosie Kay is a contemporary dancer and choreographer with an estimable national reputation. In 2004, she founded her own company, Rosie Kay Dance Company, and its quality was recognized in 2018 when it became a national portfolio, portfolio organization of the Arts Council for England. And Rosie and her company worked on challenging and controversial themes, such as the life of soldiers maimed in Iraq and Afghanistan, while maintaining a highly professional artistic level. Though the work is contemporary dance, she looks for her dancers to be balletically trained. In 2021, she was working on a contemporary version of Romeo and Juliet set among gangs in Birmingham. This work was demanding, and after a particular rehearsal, she invited some of her dancers to dinner at her home, in her home. 
She told them about a new project, a, a version of Virginia Woolf's Orlando, in which the character changes gender. Naturally, the conversation turned to contemporary ideas about transsexuality, and Rosie expressed her strongly held view that sex is real, immutable, and important. Some of her colleagues disagreed, but they not only disagreed, they complained to the board of Rosie K. Dance Company, and over the next months, a tortuous and painful process ensued involving tribunals and lawyers. There was talk of re-educating Rosie, Shades of Mao's Red Guards. And the, National, the Arts Council of England uh, was also informed that she was in, un, under investigation, which would undoubtedly have raised a question about funding. Eventually, in December 2021, the situation becoming impossible, she felt she had no option but to resign from her own company, a company she had founded, nurtured, and made nationally successful. And all because in her own house, while enjoying her hospitality, some of her own dancers had objected to her perfectly legal and deeply felt views on a controversial topic. Rosie, though, who's here, is resilient and was no doubt heartened by support from J.K. Rowling, another doughty proponent of women's immutable and biologically determined sexuality. Rosie went on to found another company, KC2, K2CO. But more important from our point of view, Rosie joined with Denise Farmy, who'd had a 15-year career with the Arts Council for England and left with a story similar to Rosie's. Together, Rosie and Denise Farmy formed, founded an organization called Freedom in the Arts to campaign for free speech in the arts and to support people in those fields who've been unfairly treated for expressing their opinions, their legal opinions, on contentious matters. And anyone who imagines that Rose's story is untrue or even uncommon should look at the testimonies this organization has received from numerous workers in the arts who've been complained about, harassed, intimidated, and often lost their jobs as well as their dignity as a result of campaigns of the type just described. They should also look at the website of the Free Speech Union with over 20,000 members, which has taken up cases of over, I think it is 2,200, but maybe Toby would um, correct me if that's wrong. Thank, thank, thank you, yes. With over 3,000 mostly ordinary people who've been harassed or worse for expressing legal but unacceptable views. And this says nothing about all of those who might well have had the same views as Rosie on transsexuality or held other controversial but not illegal opinions, but who've simply kept quiet in order to avoid the pain, depression, and loss of income all too likely to result from putting their heads above the parapet, even though, even as we saw in Rosie's case, in the privacy of her own home, where the metaphor of a parapet hardly sounds appropriate. I do, though, remember being told once, a while ago, being told never to say anything un- or anti-communist in the apartments of the Czech dissidents we used to visit in the 1980s, but to go outside into a park to speak on sensitive matters and to hand over messages and other items we were bringing in. Such a thing could not happen here? Surely not. But let us remind ourselves of the proposal of the Scottish executive in 2024 to make, quote, hate crime, even in the home, illegal and subject to prosecution, and of their 2014 proposal, which was actually quashed, but still, to appoint a state guardian, so-called, for every child in Scotland with wide-ranging powers to collect and pass on information about the child and its upbringing. Is it melodramatic or exaggerated to conjure up the situation in the Eastern Bloc in the 1980s? In some ways, yes. And we might also think of the witch trials of the 17th century or the Inquisition of the 16th. Of course, the methods in each case are different and often much worse than anything we encounter but the aim of the censors, for that is what they are, is the same, 
The aim is to make it increasingly impossible to say what goes against the orthodoxy of the senses. The senses of the pure and virtuous, whether they are inspired by a religious faith, fanatical or miserable as the case may be, or deriving from a political dogma about the way history is inevitably moving, or, as in our contemporary cases, an unceasing crusade against oppression in whatever form it happens to manifest itself, which is inherently unfulfillable. There is always oppression and equality somewhere waiting to be unearthed by zealots, so the whole enterprise amounts to what the philosopher David Wiggins called a metaphysical crusade against contingency. In each case of censorship, the aim of these enforcers is to make the heresy, religious or secular, unsayable, and by being unsayable, bit by bit, it actually becomes unthinkable. It does work. What I won't say for fear of being punished in one way or another becomes harder even to think in my own mind unless I am preternaturally strong-minded. Strong-minded, I may pride myself on being, but even I have found myself increasingly uncertain of what are the now unsayable thoughts about the British Empire, which at one time I took for granted. I might like to think this is because I have calmly and reflectively change my mind, but it may equally be because of an increasing reluctance to say anything which might make me seem the Churchillian imperialist I was at one time. For one thing, in bending to the prevailing orthodoxy, I may personally be fairly relaxed about the whole matter, whether it's about colonialism, race, sexuality, or whatever. At least, if I'm not wholly relaxed, I have other things to think and worry about, I have a life to lead, and I don't want to be bothered about things which may bring me into heated argument and worse. The censors, on the other hand, like their predecessors in Counter-Reformation Spain or Puritan Massachusetts, are utterly committed to their doctrine and ruthless in seeking out and persecuting those who may fall away from what they think is the truth even perhaps for their own good to save their souls, or whatever the equivalent is in today's New Jerusalem. Again, if you think this is an exaggeration, consider the case, the fate of Kathleen Stopp, hounded out of Sussex University for her cogent and temperately expressed philosoph philosophical skepticism about men becoming women. Or just try voicing some doubts today in a state school or bureaucracy about the existence of white privilege, or about the vibrant beauty of the full range of, full range of rainbow types of gender, or possibly even about the unalloyed evil of the British Empire, even though, to emphasize, such doubts are not illegal. Yet. Not yet, it is true. But when in 2017, Professor Nigel Bigger started a research project in the University of Oxford on the topic of colonialism entitled Ethics and Empire, a vitriolic campaign was waged to shut him and the project down. The mere fact that a dispassionate inquiry into what was seen by the opponents as an unmitigated evil was being undertaken in a top university was enough to get the whole thing and Bigger suppressed. Bigger's opponents actually failed in their attempt, despite heavy academic support, loads of academics signing petitions against it, as also happened to Kathleen Stott, and people dropping out of the research. But Bigger held firm, and he went on to publish a book on colonialism, which has actually become a bestseller. But what is not generally known is that in the wake of the campaign to close his project down, in 2019, Bigger organized a conference at Pembroke College, Oxford, on academic freedom. And Eric was there, as I was. This is not generally known because it was felt necessary to hold the conference in secret. This was partly because a number of the speakers were people from both sides of the Atlantic who had had their academic work suppressed on ideological grounds, or cancelled as the term goes, Bigger was giving them a platform 
Further comment on the irony of the situation is hardly necessary, but what's worth underlining is that in 2019, Bigger was a Regis professor at Oxford nearing retirement. One doubts that a junior researcher or academic would have survived. Some indeed at the conference had not survived, which is why they were there to tell us about their experiences. Part of the reason the more junior dissidents do not survive is because of the tactics employed by the censors. Complaints, often anonymous, are made about the person su suspected of ideological deviance. This will be built up into a campaign of internet messages to the victim's management or trustees, and maybe also, as happened to Kathleen Stock, including f physical harassment, so much so that she was advised by the police not to go onto the campus of her own university. The management <coughs> will then embark on a lengthy and demoralizing <coughs> process of investigation. Lawyers will be involved and all too often behave with the usual delay and inefficiency, while the victim will probably be in a state of genuine stress and receiving no institutional support. The point to underline here is that what amounts to severe bullying on the part of the complainants costs them absolutely nothing. Even if it is clear who they are and they do not hide behind anonymity, it is often no more than signing up to an internet petition. This can often be enough to lead a weak management to cave in to their confected outrage. So here is a totally lopsided and ine inequitable balance of forces, especially as is normally the case, the management want to appear both, quote, enlightened to the complainants and to take the easiest way out. Bullies of a more extreme sort are, of course, the Islamic extremists who threaten people with murder and even kill them for their supposed crimes of denigrating or insulting Islam. In 1989, as I suppose you will all remember, the Ayatollah Khomeini pronounced his fatwa against Salman Rushdie, putting a bounty on his head for the crime of having written the satanic verses. Since then, authors and publishers here and abroad have not been unreasonably terrified of being accused of manifesting what would now be known as Islamophobia, that is, anything that's offensive to Islamists. Books which might be seen as critical of Islam are not being written, and if they are written, find it very hard to get published. Nor should we forget that at the time of the fatwa, there were some Western politicians and commentators who were prepared, quote, to understand the Ayatollah's point of view, while, of course, not endorsing the death threats. Also at that time, well, actually it was in 1991, in the, in the independent newspaper, a columnist said that Rushdie, columnist in England, said that Rushdie had committed, quote, a deliberate mercenary act of Islamophobia, which I think is the first time that phrase was ever used in print. By contrast to these people, Mrs. Thatcher, that is Mrs. Torture in Rushdie's book, presumably no admirer of Rushdie's writing or his leftist views, arranged round-the-clock protection for him, which was a far more robust response to what was an outrageous attempt to prevent free speech and stir up violence here by the leader of a foreign country. Worryingly, though, far from being universally excoriated here, the fatwa was supported by some Muslim organisations in Britain, and it had actually been preceded by a public burning of Rushdie's book in Bradford before anyone in Tehran had noticed it, let alone read it. And being in Bradford at the time, myself, and knowing of the person who had alerted the mullahs there to Rushdie's book, a worker in community relations, needless to say, I doubt that many, if any, of the book burners had read it either. Nor does the story end there. After a number of killings and further threats following the fatwa, Rushdie himself lost the sight of an eye in a knife attack, attack in a New York literary festival as recently as 2022. Meanwhile, here in Britain, we are all aware of teachers and artists being hounded and cancelled for perceived insults, real or sometimes only imagined, to Islam. Mrs. Thatcher's response to the fatwa was in 1989. At that time, despite picketing and cancellation 
of and violence towards figures such as Roger Scruton and John Vincent when they tried to speak in universities, governments were generally content to uphold free speech within the law. Since then, though, along with the growth of campaigns attacking figures such as those of Rosie Kay and a militantly Islamic activity designed to suppress the suppression of views seen as objectionable, there has been considerable erosion of what might be called state impartiality over speech and other forms of expression, which goes beyond actual breaches of the law. The police now listen to complaints from members of the public about things other people have said and or are supposed to have said and have put on the internet. They will sometimes follow up their complaints knocking on people's doors and record incidents of what are called legal but harmful speech and communications. They are also known, somewhat Orwellianly, to tell people about whose views they disapprove that they, the police, need to check their thinking which is what happened in 2019 to Harry Miller, an ex-police officer who tweeted a gender-critical verse about which apparently someone had complained. Among many other examples of this sort, only this month, the journalist Alison Pearson has been harassed by the police for a tweet of hers, and cases have recently come to light of children being found culpable by the police of non-culpable hate incidents, for making unpleasant remarks and tweets about other children, but found culpable by the police, be it noted, not in a court of law. Meanwhile, while the last government introduced a bill which would fine universities found to be sufficiently vigorous about protecting freedom of speech and research in their institutions and ensuring that legitimately invited speakers could speak without hindrance, the present government is planning to drop this provision, apparently on the grounds that it sees no problem here, nothing to see here. To this, all I can say is that they should try telling that to the numbers of women who've been prevented from speaking on transgender issues in universities. And they should also have been at the 2019 Conference on Academic Freedom. Now, in discussing freedom of speech, it's important to realize that as with any other freedom, freedom of speech is not absolute. It would not or should not allow people to libel or defame others without recourse, nor should confidences be betrayed, something civil servants, apparently with direct, direct lines to the Guardian, do not always appreciate. Nor should it protect speech intended to and likely to provoke immediate unlawful action, the stress here being on intention, likelihood, provocation and immediate. Merely rhetorically urging smash the system in some indeterminate way at the end of a thinly attended student debate would be allowable, but it might be very different if shouted at an already militantly inclined crowd armed with clubs and machetes outside a government building occupied by reviled officials. Whether free speech should allow to be expressed, sorry, should allow support to be expressed for a terrorist organization such as Hamas, I think depends somewhat on the context and circumstances. And having written about it several times, I'm well aware of Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance, whereby people and organizations critical of the liberal dispens dispensation I am here defending engage in violent talk precisely pro to provoke the government to suppress them so that they can then say that liberalism has its limits and pave the way to further subversion of liberty. Of course, the attitude of the government in such a case will be to suggest that the speech in question amounts to dangerous, illiberal provocation, which it might indeed do. And here, as Popper himself argued, a liberal government might have a duty to censor it. Currently, the law to possess documents, even electronic documents, there is a law, likely to be useful to persons committing or preparing an act of terrorism. There is such a law. And this applies even if the person in question claims to have a reasonable excuse for possessing the documents. But does this unnecessarily illiberal and intrusive... Sorry, should we support this 
possibly illiberal and intrusive provision in the case of someone simply concerned to understand the mindset of the terrorist. Conrad might well have fallen foul of such a provision had it existed when he was writing The Secret Agent. My own feeling is that each case of this sort needs to be taken on its own terms, and there may well be difficult and borderline cases, depending on circumstances. Other things being equal, though, I think one's first reaction should be to permit, to permit such speech, though, with Popper, I would argue that such tolerance should not be seen as categorical or absolute. Nor, in my opinion, should free speech be interpreted as a license to produce pornography, though there will, of course, be disagreements as to what counts as pornography or objectionable pornography, and there will also be furious arguments about whether government attempts to legislate in this area are, are, are valid. So I will confine myself here to saying that a right for free speech should not be understood as giving a free pass, so to speak, to pornographers. Now, when I was young, there was a saying, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but names will never hurt me. On the whole, most of us accepted this. I mean, most of us youngsters in the 1950s. And also accepted names and name calling as part of life. I remember being abused as a Catholic, which I was, and Irish, which I was only by some quirk of descent. But the adage was wrong. Names can hurt and, be, and can be used hurtfully. It is clear that with the growth of the social, the social media, hurtful and offensive abuse is more widespread than previously, and also that, significantly, people feel themselves more offended and hurt by it. But should it be a matter for the state to intervene? Should this not be a matter for people, adult people anyway, to sort out for themselves? How, in any case, can the state and state officials judge what is offensive? The situation is hardly improved by the doctrine that seems to be generally accepted now, in official circles anyway, that if you feel offended, if you feel offended, you are offended. And the practice that then officialdom will step in Indeed, that is just what the College of Policing guidance from 2014 on such matters stipulates. A non-crime hate incident must be recorded if the victim perceives it as hostile or prejudicial towards himself or someone who is transgender or with some other protected characteristic under the 2010 Equality Act. What we have to consider here is what appears to be, whether what appears to be a contemporary erosion of free speech in, in these non-crime, non-criminal hate incidents is necessarily a bad thing. To begin with, we should emphasize once again that free speech is not absolute. Its deployment will not sanction either defamatory speech or intentional incitement to immediate unlawful action. And there may also be specific and unusual occasions in war, for example, where a conflict of com with a conflict of competing goods, its suspension may be required. But these provisions aside, it is normally a right which should not be overridden. Usually at this point, it is said that in an age of gargantuan and largely unrestricted social media, there are horrific examples of unpleasant and offensive tweets and the like, which cause people a great deal of pain and stress. And it cannot be denied that there is some truth in this, or that there are not strong reasons for restricting the access of children to social media to the extent that this could be done. And indeed, I would favour not allowing children onto the internet or smartphones until they're 16, at least not unsupervised. But in the case of adults, it is different. And here I would first simply echo the familiar million point about the way free speech and discussion is the best route to finding out the truth on contested issues. But rather than rehearsing this familiar point, I want now to end this uh, talk um, on, on censorship um, about a more basic reason 
for being against the suppression of free speech. And basically, it, it's that it infantilizes people and infantilizes the society in which it is imposed, on which it is imposed. As de Tocqueville pointed out in Democracy in America in 1840, the suspension of discussion and opinion is not confined or will not be confined to theocratic or monarchical regimes. Democracy has its own form of tyranny in a way as insidious as the rack and thumbscrew of Elizabethan times. It lies in the tendency of democracies to suppress individual differences, either through the manipulation of public opinion or even through a beneficent or supposedly beneficent authority imposing a regime of what it seems as kindness, a word that's always being used, equality and inclusion. Such a regime, de Tocqueville says, this is de Tocqueville's quotation, this is from de Tocqueville, covers the whole of life with a network of petty, complicated rules that are both minute and uniform, through which even men of the greatest originality and the most vigorous temperament cannot force their heads above the crowd. It is not at all tyrannical, but it hinders, restrains, enervates, stifles, and stultifies, so much so that in the end, each nation is no more than a flock of timid and hard-working animals with the government as its shepherd. I think that would resound with Rosie Kay and Harry Miller, who in their small way force their heads above the crowd, though whether they would agree with the idea that the regime which pursued them is not at all tyrannical, well, we'll have to ask Rosie. With the curbs on free speech, with which, we've, which I've already noted, it certainly seems to be the way policy and police practice are tending. And we should also recall Thomas Jefferson's telling remark about a tyranny of 176 democratic tyrants is still a tyranny. A regime of censorship, indeed, with individuals being censored and, put it bluntly, on matters on which adults who have a responsibility and a right to come to their own conclusions about what they should think and value are being treated as children for whom such responsibilities are beyond them. Of course, I do not mean that everyone should come to their own conclusions about quantum theory, say, where there is genuine expertise to which most of us could not aspire. But I would expect and hope that everyone, every adult, should expect some concern for what he or she holds in the realm of basic human principles and values. And this is typically where the censorship I'm complaining about will impinge, deciding, for example, on what is harmful if legal, such decisions being handed to experts in the matter. All too often, claims to expertise here are attempts to dismiss the views of the wise and the long experience of the many and the wise, where Aristotle would see moral sense. There is often a failure to realize that moral knowledge, such as it is, draws on the cumulative experience and wisdom of generations. Expertise, so-called expertise in this area, is, in Burke's telling phrase, the importunate clink of half a dozen grasshoppers which drowns out the accumulated wisdom of the thousands of great cattle who repose beneath the shadow of the British oak. I quote this phrase not only because I like it, but also because it is precisely the views of today's thousands of great cattle which are being drowned out in the ways we have seen. Or to put it another way, Burke's way, censors and the cancellers of today, this is Burke, despise experience as the wisdom of unlettered men who need to be whipped into line. They call it kindness, that is, the experts, but cut adrift from the common nature and common relation of humankind, back again, their liberty is not liberal, it censors. Their science is presumptuous ignorance. It cannot, they cannot convincingly explain the validity of their claims. 
and their humanity is savage and brutal towards those who will not confirm, conform, who lose their jobs and self-respect. This is not to say that there are not cases or might not be cases where people of a progressive bent are not sometimes shouted down, which is unforgivable, but they are rarely cancelled, lose their jobs, receive visits from the police, or have their social media or other accounts cancelled, as has happened in a number of cases recently. Indeed, to consider the last type of censorship, there is a clear danger that we are moving imperceptibly to a Chinese-style form of supervision of our views, both by government and by big business. Creeping authoritarianism on the part of the government is also evidenced by the possibility that individuals will find themselves in trouble for expressing misogynistic or Islamophobic, Islamophobic views. But who is to decide what exactly counts as misogyny or Islamophobia? It is well known that some Muslim campaigners on the latter point would include anything which made them feel uncomfortable by querying or putting into question fundamentals of their religious practice. Nor should we overlook the danger that restrictions on free speech, however well-intentioned, may morph easily curbs on criticism of government policy, the ability to make which without fear or favour is a keynote of an open society, and indeed one of the reasons for having and defending free speech in the first place. Of course, free speech, like any other right or freedom, is, is open to abuse. There can be highly offensive utterances which do not break the law, and these can be upsetting, to say the least. On public vitriol, having received a certain amount myself, I would suggest that people so affected simply shrug it off, or not look or listen to it. Learn to be resilient if you're entering the public square. Disinformation, phrased a word that I didn't know much about until a few months ago, disinformation is more tricky because it is not always by or by any means clear what is to count as disinformation. It is hard to see attempts to censor disinformation not subtly morphing into forms of censorship as when during the COVID outbreak, scientists and others who questioned the direction of government policy on lockdowns were effectively shut out of internet platforms. In any case, should adults not be allowed to make their own decisions and come to their own conclusions? There is nothing to stop people concerned about disinformation posting their rebuttals or people upset by tweets and the like from turning them off or not watching them. There is a price to pay for free speech, but the price is worth paying, and certainly better than a situation in which what we can say and think is controlled by others, particularly by powerful and authoritarian others. Disinformation, or more broadly lying or evasion of the truth, may be a problem, but it is a problem attendant on much supposedly respectable political campaigning and journalism. And who is to be trusted? Sorry, adults have to be trusted to see through blatant falsehoods. And I would wager that any, many, or even most people are quite well aware when they are being manipulated by the official media and political sources as much as on unofficial si sites on the internet. Isn't something like that precisely what happened in the recent US presidential election? And even if they were not aware, even if people were not aware when they were being fed disinformation, we hardly need George Orwell's 1984 to feel that there is something more than slightly creepy about the government itself having what is in effect a ministry of truth to verify what is or is not disinformation. Nor should we underestimate the role played in the undermining of dictatorships by unofficial media, often by necessity and anonymously produced, which would no doubt be stigmatized as sources of disinformation and banned by the governments they exposed. So I don't think that everybody who goes on the internet should have to say who they are, because having anonymous reports from abroad was very helpful 
in the end of the um, Soviet Empire. Indeed, Roger Scruton published quite a number of such anonymous articles in the Salisbury Review in the 1980s, which gave great um, succor to the people who wrote them from Czechoslovakia. Censorship and the denial of free speech treats its victims and indeed the rest of society as children who have to be, treat, have to be instructed as to what to say and think and excluded or punished in other ways if they manifest disobedience. The question I will leave you with is why we or anyone should trust the instructors who clearly lack the confidence of actually defending their own views and the courage of defending or modifying them in open discussion, which is why they have to resort to emphasizing the inconveniences of free speech as a justification for suppressing it. Well, I was just going to ask if we might possibly turn on the heating again. Right. So those of you who wish to protect yourself against the encroaching Arctic weather, please do. Meanwhile, Professor Kaufman can prepare himself to agree with or rebut Professor O'Hare's thesis. And then we'll have questions from you. As I said before, please keep them pertinent and concise and your observations you can put over drinks, which is exactly the right place for them. Okay, um, great. So I'm, I'm used to the cold because I'm from Canada, uh, which is, by the way, the home of the land acknowledgement and of Justin Trudeau. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm not, uh, there's not a, a whole lot for me to take issue with in that, that erudite uh, presentation um, from my colleague, uh, Anthony O. Here, um, what I want to do is really sort of use it as, I, I mean, I will respond to a number of points, but I also want to sort of use it to sort of look at sort of a, the empirical descriptive social scientific side of this, because I think we have a threat, which is woke, which I'll define in a minute, but I also think we have a new opportunity, actually. I actually think we have an opportunity to really change the culture, because what's happened is woke has leached off campus into the rest of society. As Andrew Sullivan put it, we all live on campus now, but that now means this ideology has entered electoral politics. It's led to the downfall of Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, Leo Varadkar in Ireland. It is damaging hugely Justin Trudeau in Canada. And of course, it, uh, if the um, analyses are correct, uh, the Trump campaign's video on trans is what helped, well, according, according to a number of um, in, internal Democratic strategists, this helped swing the election to Trump. So culture war is no longer confined to campus the way it was when I was at university during what I call the second awakening when political correctness, Eurocentrism, and hey-ho, Western Civ has to go. When that was around, it was criticized, but it was criticized by intellectuals and it remained on campus, and and actually rem remember, actually interviewing John O'Sullivan um, in I think it was nineteen ninety five or nineteen ninety six when you were still at National Review, uh, and I also interviewed Francis Fukuyama at that time, who was saying, well, who was a big critic of political correctness, but it never really left campus. It didn't decide elections. Now that it's deciding elections, actually, it's out in the open. It's been flushed into the open. I think it can be defeated more decisively. Um, so just a couple of, just to sort of talk to us, a number of points that were made by Anthony. I mean, really what we're facing here are two forces. I mean, one is a top-down state censoring non-crime hate incidents, throwing you in jail for tweets. So that's a sort of discipline exerted from the state. Very classical, liberal, has to be resisted. But then there's something at the next level down, which is the level of institutions, universities, schools, dance companies, corporations, it's private censorship, to use Jonathan Turley's phrase. I think that's actually almost a bigger problem. Um, and that has to be attacked in possibly a different way. So the um, Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act, which I was involved in a small way in, is one way of using government to actually reform institutions because society 
has three layers. There's government institutions and citizens. If the institutions like a university is suppressing speech, if they're repressing the population, it is absolutely right and proper for de democratically elected governments to intrude and intervene into these institutions and regulate them and make them uphold free speech. I think that's absolutely correct and proper. Um, there is also, however, beyond the sort of top-down vertical, if you like, punishment of speech and censorship, there's another issue, and again, which was touched on uh, by Anthony, which is mob violence. But not only mob violence, I mean, we saw that with Kathleen Stock, but we also have something even more subtle than mob violence and mobs putting pressure on in institutions to cancel people. Um, and there are many, many examples we could cite of cancellation, but there's something even more insidious I want to talk about, which is what happens if you're in an institution where you can't be a Brexiteer or you can't be a Trump supporter? We know that 40% of American academics in studies I've done would not hire a known Trump supporter. One third of British academics wouldn't hire a known Brexit supporter. So if you want a job or if you want to get hired or you want a grant, um, you're not going to let anybody know your politics. And so that's going to lead to self-censorship. So in addition to censorship, we've got a problem of self-censorship going on where people in, for example, a university who might be conservative, and there's maybe 5 to 10% of academics who are conservative, uh, will not, it's career limiting to actually allow that view. And I'm, it's the same in a dance company, and no doubt. <laughs> so uh, in the arts. Um, so we've got these two problems of censorship and self-censorship. Um, Anthony mentioned the communist regimes where people were scared to put their head above the parapet. I think that's true. There is this, what's, um, what's called preference falsification. There is this going on, but there is also a lot of genuine belief, and I don't think we should fool ourselves into thinking that a lot of academics or head teachers are secretly supportive of free speech. Actually, there's something called a, a mandatory diversity statement, um, which some of you may be familiar with, which means you have to demonstrate your loyalty to DEI ideology to get a job or get a research grant um, in, in the US, in Canada is where it's the worst, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Um, this is a form of compelled speech. Now, some optimists who say, oh, woke is declining, right? Firms are cutting back on DEI. It's, de it's in decline. Uh, you know, look, Harvard has gotten rid of mandatory diversity statements. The reality is that two-thirds, roughly 60% of academics at elite universities support mandatory diversity statements in surveys. So this is not something they are backing because they're scared of stepping out of line. They believe in it. And so I think we have to reckon with the fact that there is a genuine belief in this thing called woke. Now, what is woke? One sentence. It is the making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups, out of which comes two sort of loose philosophical beliefs. Equal outcomes, i.e. affirmative action, and emotional harm protection for members of these groups. And that's the equal outcomes part means you've got to discriminate against whites, men, Asians. The um, emotional harm protection means no free speech because that might offend the sensibilities and the emotional safety of members of such, a, such groups. Um, so that is what woke is. It is a genuine belief system which people deeply believe. I, ha I hate to, I've been in academia 25 years now and they deeply believe it. Not all of them, but enough of them. And so one of the things that we notice, for example, is that people who are on the left are much more likely to unfriend, be unwilling to date, um, be willing to discriminate against people of the other, of a conservative belief system. So they're much more politically prejudicial. And the reason for this is because they think conservatives are violating the sacred values anti-racism at the top, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, transphobia. And it's because they think conservatives are evil, not just wrong, that is why they discriminate against them so heavily. And until we root out that ideology, we are never going to solve this problem. The idea that just because some tech firms have cut back on DEI that this thing is going away is a dream. It's an absolute dream. And in fact, you just have to look at the views of young people um, you know, in this country 
young people split 50-50 on whether J.K. Rowling should be dropped by her publisher, whereas anybody over 50, it's like one, two, three percent. So we have a huge problem with the Gen Z, and when they become the median leader uh, in the corporate world or the median voter, I think we're going to see a resurgence, which is possibly going to be worse than the present awakening. Um, now, I did mention some good news, and the good news is that this ideology is now out into the open, and we are starting to see a political pushback, because there's really two issues. One is the long-term battle of ideas. We've got to defeat this, and the Free Speech Union, New Culture Forum, University of Buckingham, uh, all of these institutions are hugely important in that task. We have to win this battle of ideas. But there is also the short term, which is two-thirds of the public in Britain, Canada, and the United States are anti-woke, and yet the institutions are all woke. How do we get the institutions to look like the public? That can only happen through the kind of politics that we're now seeing. And I, I've been, I was just talking to some people at the Heritage Foundation today, and, they, and a whole bunch of people, in, I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, they are deadly serious about getting rid of DEI in government and in institutions and eliminating critical race and gender ideology from the school system. This is exactly the kind of this is the kind of pol politics that we need. The only way that happens is when culture becomes much more central to what conservatism is. You can't just talk about foreign policy or the economy. You have to make the culture war and I know that's not it's not my favorite term, but pushing back against the left's culture war is the, the way I would put it. That has to become much more central. You look at the American right now, they've got the Federalist Society channeling talent from universities into the judiciary. They've got Project 2025 and similar, uh, you know, they've got, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, Mums for Liberty. They have all these organizations that are channeling talent into cultural fights they're much more organized. There's nothing like that here, or I, I dare say in Canada. So I think the U.S. is certainly leading uh, in terms of pushing back on this, making the institutions look like public opinion. I think this is an exciting time. Uh, I think we're going to see some very interesting policy innovation already in American universities, for example, academics and administrators are running scared because of anti-DEI laws, and they are winding up a lot of the uh, corrupt, woke uh, indoctrination that was going on prior, uh, previously. So I really think there's a policy way forward for this. But conservative parties have to be a lot more focused on this issue than they have been. Um, really, with that, I'm just going to leave it to you. And um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. Um, sorry, everyone, having frozen you now, we're now going to deafen and roast you. Uh, but I'm so glad to see that you are committed to free speech like we are. What I'm going to do is walk around and ask for you to give uh, sort of two or three questions at once and bring the microphone back to our speakers. So hands up, please, those of you who wish to ask a question, I'll bring it along, starting with Professor Black. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I just ask, what about communities? Because it seems to me that you can often have, if you wish to use the term control or whatever, well, you know, the limitation coming from communities, neighbourhoods, they can be just as bad as any institution. And, it, I, you know, one of the interesting things is, if you're thinking of society as is now often thought of in terms of ethnic or religious communities, they themselves can actually be policing their members members in a very unpleasant way. Uh, thank you. Um, a simple question. How do ordinary people survive and counter the tyranny of overconfident authoritarian midwits? Who wants to kick off? Um, well, I don't have the um, social scientific expertise of Eric. But I, I think that, um, the, the, well, first of all, you know, the community pressure is obviously something that everybody has to contend with. And I think people should be brought up to think that, um, th that they should stand up against of some received view if, if, if they're not um, happy with it and they shouldn't be ashamed to do it. But obviously, th this is a personal matter that may well require some courage. Um, I, 
I like very much what Eric was saying. And I think that I don't know whether there's much hope of getting um, government um, to do anything here in, in Britain at the moment. But I am, I do think that actually the trans, I don't know what word you should use, transgender, this whole question, um, it, it's been interesting because um, many people, or indeed probably most people, most ordinary people, um, think that it's wrong to have men playing in women's football or whatever. You can speak a little more into the microphone. Yeah, yes, um, and I think this has actually woken, against woke, th th this issue has woken, awakened people, th the vast majority of people, into wanting to resist the pressure that there is to conform in this matter. I also think that um, in schools, it is quite true that, that in many history lessons, people will get a very um, biased, anti-British view of history. And of course, there are lots of things wrong in British history anyway. I have to say that for my Irish background. But I think that ordinary people um, are pretty fed up when they find, or many ordinary people anyway, when they find that children in their schools are being given a completely negative view of British history and no, um, giving no accord to the, you know, the achievements of not just of the, not of the British Empire, but but of um, constitutional achievements of, uh, of indeed f such things as free speech. So I think that as I do have some hope that as these issues become more public and not, as it were, confined to the universities and the Guardian, but ordinary people become aware of how these things are impinging on their lives and the lives of their children, I th do see um, some optimism, some hope that there will be a, a kickback on all of this. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, just I'll quickly address the what can the average uh, person do? I mean, I think the first thing is to try, you know, Everyone's going to have their own ability to resist, but if there are new buzzwords, try and resist them. Try and use the traditional language rather than the new uh, politically correct language. Um, if you're an inst in an institution, try and find like-minded people to organize. You know, So at a university, if you can find other people who are pro-free speech uh, and there are ways to do that, then you can organize and mobilize to resist policies like DEI policies. Um, and then finally, getting active in your community and also in your you know, if, possibly political party. You know, one of the things in, in Canada, for example, one of the reasons the trans issue has been forced onto the agenda is the grassroots party, conservative party members have not been willing to allow the politicians to just go business as usual and kowtow to the left. So, Grassroots pressure can make a difference if you could push push that pressure. I ultimately think, however, that a lot of the big change is going to have to come through politics, um, and uh, because ultimately people respond to incentives. You know, the reason Harvard doesn't, and the reason they drop mandatory diversity statements isn't because of staff pressure, but it's because the Republicans were hauling their president in front of a, a congressional committee. It's because of bad press, and eventually the trustees got annoyed and put pressure. So, you know, in a way, I do think incentives are very important, which is why I think that this has to become politicized. There are useful idiots who say that, you know, uh, politicizing these issues is stoking the culture wars, being divisive. Anyone who actually says that is essentially just, as I said, a, a useful idiot for the woke takeover. These issues must be elevated and politicized explicitly if we're going to solve them. Could I just add one thing to that? Yes, I mean, but I don't think there'll be political movement unless there's an upsurge of grassroots views, because... Most politicians are only going to act on what they think their voters want. But if, if they are firmly got it in their minds that the voters don't like certain things, that is probably the quickest way to get them to do something. Yeah, no, no, I'd agree. I just, what I would say is there are elite norms, though, sometimes that it's a bit unseemly. You know, just like everyone should wear a tie if you're a politician. You know, there's this view that it's a bit unseemly to raise these these issues, and we really shouldn't be talking about that if we are good 
gentlemen, right? I mean, I think that is a huge problem. Uh, I think these elite norms uh, encode a lot of wokery uh, because they say, you know, you should be kind and nice and really, you know, we don't want to raise these issues, do we? Um, so I think that we have to break through that barrier. I mean, again, the U.S., because of what's happened to the Republican Party, it's a lot more populist. You won't find that as much amongst that willingness to re take the risk, be called transphobic plow through that I mean some reputational I take more questions if anyone can down right I'm going to move back because we've only got five minutes one at the back um hello Rosie K um <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep it brief, but yes, I was told that it's no longer EDI, it's E. And I was literally one of the sad. They're not. They're learning that by not speaking, they're not thinking. These institutions to the ground. Same thing. Do we save them? And the young gentleman's your own. Perhaps somewhat ironic. I'm going to ask about the boundaries from the things you said that you don't speech. So I would ask, what principle do you think does bound it, and, and is that really just harm? And if so. Are we simply just debating with the other side about what harm means? Good evening. Hello, uh, Lewis Fielder. I work for a, a large global corporation that you you will have heard of. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article for The Spectator magazine uh, debunking the pseudoscience behind unconscious bias training. And very shortly thereafter, the firm's HR department launched an investigation into me for breaching the DEI policy at the firm, from which I was exonerated, having thankfully joined the Free Speech Union, which helped me through that. Uh, earlier this year, having publicly condemned Hamas for its invasion of Israel and uh, murder of Israeli citizens, I was then subject to a second HR investigation for non-inclusive behaviors, from which I was then also exonerated. But people like Rosie will know that's a very stressful set of situations to go through when your primary income stream is, is threatened. So uh, to the speakers, what do you think should be done about that? Do we just need more legislation? Or is it about the sort of grassroots or other political pressure we have to put on private sector organizations? Um. Okay, I've I've been investigated four times, so I beat you. Um, no, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no. I mean, just on that <clears throat> on that question. I mean, I do think there is legislation um, <clears throat> that could make it harder for firms to crack down on on free speech. Um, so uh, I do think there are some legislative approaches uh, that could protect people's. Um, Right for right of free speech without suffering a detriment. Um, and now, of course, the exact line is is to, to be determined by the occupation. If you're in MI5 and you divulge state secrets, clearly that's a different thing. Um, but I think the line needs to be established and can be established in law. <clears throat> Just one other uh, comment on Rosie. Um, do, do we need new institutions or burn them to the ground? I mean... I would say it depends on the sector. So in media and podcasting, it's low barriers to entry. You can set up new ins institutions. Um, however, with universities and tech firms and in other sectors, it's very difficult. You, you, you should set the new, new institutions up, but I don't think we can really afford to give up on the establishment. And that's why we need government to, for example, regulate what is taught in schools. You can't indoctrinate in critical race and gender idea. We can't just go to school choice. I don't think school choice is going to work. Um, so I, I th and, and you can look at Elon Musk <clears throat> taking over, um, excuse me, <clears throat> Elon Musk taking over Twitter had a much bigger impact than Gab and Parler and Truth Social. And that's an example of where when you have these network effects, these establishments are very important and there's really no way other than regulating or capturing them. Um, so I'd say it's both and, yes. 
Well, uh, while I would like to see government legislation on some of these matters, I don't think we're likely to get it. And we're certainly not likely to get a more um, traditional curriculum from the current government that's just about to dismantle the advances that have been made in the national curriculum by Michael sitting at the back. They're, they're going to unwind all those things. So I, I don't... I think we have to be pessimistic about any government policy here in Britain in the short term. And I would actually, I, I, I said some critical things about social media and so on. Actually, I think that there can be subtracts and podcasts and things I don't know anything about, but, but um, ways of reaching people, um, putting diversive views, dissident views, which do seem to get a foothold. And so while fully being aware of the dangers that the um, new media produce, I think that much of the kickback against this woke um, dominance, and I, and of course I agree that conservative politicians have been completely pusillanimous in doing anything about it. Um, Jeremy Clarkson hasn't been. Um, you, you know, these people can do these things and they can get um, popularity and um, they can influence people. And probably they can even influence people in schools because I, I don't think that most children like being told that their country is rubbish, actually. Yeah, I just want to add to that uh, really good point that uh, the internet and social media does allow us to bypass gatekeepers. And it's really interesting, a couple of things, uh, attitudes to uh, on the trans issue. For example, uh, should there be single sex or unisex bathrooms? If you look in this country amongst eight, under 25s, those attitudes have gone against the trans position about 20 points in the last 18 months, and something similar has been happening in North America. So, uh, and, and in Canada, it may, despite the heavy duty indoctrination in the school system, actually young Canadians are every bit, you know, they are actually the most conservative segment of the voting population. So I think you're right, that there is hope there that, that young people through the internet and social media uh, can get around the indoctrination. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings to an end the formal part of the evening. I'd like to thank Professor Anthony O'Hare and Professor Eric Kaupfen for their words. Please do all stay, enjoy the wine, warm yourselves with alcohol in the traditional Northern European way. Um, I think there is a reason for this conference taking place now. Of all the reasons for the triumph of Western civilization, parliamentary democracy, property rights, absolutely at the core of that is the free exchange of ideas, putting yourself in the crucible in front of your fellow man and being willing to stand up for what you believe and those ideas that exchange is under threat. You all have to do your bit. We all have to do our bit. On behalf of the Danube Institute, thank you for doing that tonight. And on behalf of all our partner organizations, thank you for your presence and your indulgence. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Enjoy the rest of the evening.